I'm not sure about you, but my educational past as a 22-year-old non-Indigenous woman looks a little bit like dot painting, hunter-gatherer narratives, and this idea of spear-wielding Aboriginal people. I was, like probably most of you, presented with this idea that Indigenous culture was something of Australia's history, or that this narrative and culture only existed in remote Australia, with a select few people. However, since deciding to pursue a degree in Indigenous studies, I've realised how false this narrative is and how culture maybe isn't set to a time or place, but sometimes a person or people. So how do we change this? Well, it kind of took me three years of uni to rewire my brain to think maybe the things I've been taught or are being told are not the only narrative perspective or way of knowing. But you definitely don't need a uni degree for this. My name's Gidget Watkins, this is Yarning Circle, and today I'll be yarning with Claire Marshallsea about education, in particular, understanding the barriers, importance and opportunities of quality education. I do, however, wish to start by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri people and their elders past and present, who are the traditional owners on the land in which I'm currently located, which is Melbourne's east. So Claire, the good the bad and the just plain ignorant. What's the worst thing looking back that you were taught pre-uni? So for me, through my education, the only exposure to anything that resembled Indigenous studies was the mention of Indigenous people sort of as a backdrop to narratives about um, colonial settlers, Captain Cooks and so so on. And it wasn't presented to me in a way where they had any like side of the narrative that was theirs any agency or any even opinion it was sort of just like a mention um and it sort of was implied that they handed over the land without any issues oh like, yeah almost gave it to the european settlers and this sort of um idea of like a hierarchical way of thinking that puts indigenous people as lesser in like this hunter narr- hunter gatherer narrative that they needed to have this civilization and they almost enjoyed being civilized into um, what we know as as modern Australia is I think a really damaging narrative that a lot of Australians have. Our age have. Yeah, our age. Which is so bizarre because I feel like we're such well-informed people now, Mm -hmm. but like we're not really because we haven't gone back and changed those perspectives in our head honestly for me it's the rabbit proof fence they Mm -hmm. literally just went oops with the whole stolen generation and they were like this is adequate enough to teach you about the white australia policy but showing this movie didn't equate to giving students any kind of real knowledge about the stolen generation for me it was just again set me up with this idea that it was well that was all it was it was a static event and it just completely failed to address like any systemic issues of child removal that like continue to persist in Australia. Yeah, it was presented in a way that it's something that happened once in the past, it was this isolated event like in a void, and it doesn't continue to affect people and continue to happen just in different, more masked ways that policies affect people. Yeah, well kids are getting taken at higher rates than during the stolen yeah. generation, which a lot of people <laughs> neglect to even mention now. Mm-hmm. Maybe for us, it was disengaged teachers, but now from talking to a few teachers that I know, their understanding seems so different from what my teachers presented me with. Yeah, since then, fortunately, things have somewhat improved, especially um, at Swinburne, for example, nursing students do have to take Indigenous studies units to... um, have some cultural sensitivity yeah and teachers and And like that's really important because not only does it flow through and build on what they've learned previously at primary school and high school but at university you kind of start to engage in conversations that you previously wouldn't have had however while adding one mandatory unit is definitely a step in the right direction i guess the question we need to ask is is this enough for teachers to be confident teaching about indigenous knowledges history and culture i I think it really boils down to teachers continuously connecting with Indigenous perspectives inside and outside of the classroom. Yeah, it's definitely not easy as a non-Indigenous person to speak on Indigenous topics, especially to summarise it to a classroom of kids yeah, in a way that's that accurate. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Introducing real perspectives into classrooms would be difficult. I guess teachers would fear like tokenising Indigenous culture 
actually, I read an article regarding this from the conversation and they're talking about pushing teachers to become air quotation marks around this more holistic in their approach to teaching. So they don't feed into these stereotypes that I guess teachers fed into when we were in high school Mm -hmm. and probably a lot of you guys too. So how can teachers manage this to fit it into a strict idea of curriculum that we currently have? I don't think it needs to essentially be managed. I think like, to be honest with you, the whole system of education seems a little bit corrupt to me at times. um, When you really look at it, like even though kids are being taught about Australian indigenous history, it seems educational models tend to focus on center, like, periphery thinking and like always at this center is western eurocentric knowledges ways of knowing and narratives and also perspectives yeah it often seems like it's boiled down to a simplified version of an indigenous perspective just to sort of tick a box and fulfill a criteria rather than an actual accurate representation of indigenous perspectives and culture yeah even in your episode claire you mentioned that words such as preservation instead of revival feed into this narrative that we're talking about. Yeah, I think it's important to take into account the power that the language we use has. And words like preservation, putting language in the past, is something that silences and seconds Indigenous voices and narratives and ways of knowing, which is something that we really need to keep in mind and change if we do um, make a mistake in the language that we use. Yeah. I understand that sometimes getting these perspectives and understanding what's right and wrong can be difficult because there is a myriad of non-Indigenous perspectives at the top of our media and government and most institutions and systems in Australia and I guess the world. But I think the best way around this is to introduce Indigenous perspectives into your daily lives. It is seriously something as simple as following someone on Instagram who is Indigenous or reading literature or watching movies made by Indigenous people or documentaries. This actually also applies to any marginalised group, whether it be someone who is Indigenous or someone who is part of the LGBTQIA plus community or I guess both. And you get to introduce yourself to new ideas and new knowledges and it's just so simple. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the conversations about Indigenous education are currently dominated by problems and barriers faced and historical barriers. Yeah, honestly, like everything I've kind of researched for this, it is always talking about these barriers, whether they be from Indigenous or non-Indigenous perspectives. But I think it's really important to change and push this conversation in a new way to create better perceptions and better ideals in students. So how do we reframe these conversations? I guess the most important thing is to start talking about the opportunities of teaching Indigenous knowledges in classrooms and how that can benefit all students, not just Indigenous kids. Um, When I was doing my research for this podcast, I kind of stumbled across a framework for teaching Uh, which is the Eight Ways Initiative. To best explain what the Eight Ways Initiative is, here is a direct quote off their website. By deeply integrating Aboriginal knowledges through incorporating Indigenous learning techniques into the core curriculum, the framework focuses on story sharing, learning maps, symbols and images, land links, nonverbal, deconstruct, reconstruct, and community-linked way of teaching. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I see current curriculum frameworks and teaching methods failing to fix the incompetencies that plague non-Indigenous students. We need classrooms that build up and foster Indigenous perspectives. A program like Eight Ways keeps core curriculum, but it shifts the way, I guess, this core curriculum is being taught. So it's focusing more on Indigenous knowledge acquisition and knowledge transmission. Implementing programs as such, I guess, not only improves cultural competencies in non- the non-Indigenous students, but it also improves the outcomes of Indigenous students alike. And I guess this is because by understanding and highlighting and respecting Indigenous culture, we are creating a place in classrooms for Indigenous students to have their own identity. 
So for our listeners out there who may not be undertaking Indigenous studies at university, what do you recommend for them? A really large number of Indigenous written literature has helped me um, in researching this podcast to be able to gain the, I guess, whole picture of our conversation of reconciliation. And one book in particular was Sand Talks by Tyson Young Porter. Shout out to my man. Um, I think the book is not only a really easy to read book, but it's also really fun and a great way to learn about Indigenous culture and knowledge acquisition in a way that I don't think at all you need to be familiar with or have any background knowledge of Aboriginal knowledge acquisition. But I think reading any Indigenous written literature is really a great place to start. You've read the book, Claire. What do you think? Yeah, something I really enjoyed about it was the way he um, included experiences from around the country and even overseas of different Indigenous perspectives. And it's a really enjoyable read that I recommend to any of our listeners. Definitely, definitely. Especially how he like links it back to these um, images and symbols in the books. It's just, it's an incredible book. One of the things I do also want to mention while we're talking about Tyson um, is that he was one of the lead researchers in the Eight Ways program. And I think it's really important to note the changes that I discussed to teaching methods or even curriculum need to be influenced by and even written by Indigenous people for us to be taking a step in the right direction. Obviously, curriculum is very different state to state, but by just looking at the Closing the Gap report, you can see that what we're currently doing isn't working. So it's time to change our method. Is language revival even a part of the Closing the Gap initiative? It is included as a goal, um, but like I've mentioned in my episode, the variety of language experiences changes the goals and strategies that are required. So it's not really a simple process. Yeah, no, deeply, I think deeply integrating Indigenous perspective and community links at all levels of these initiatives is crucial for them to be successful and is also a key step towards self-determination and reconciliation. Niani's episode, which features next on this podcast, discusses uh, self-determination by the means of Uluru statement from the heart in a lot more depth. I guess what I want you all to do today is go and evaluate the education that you've had are uh, having and try to take the next steps in ensuring that you are more culturally competent. Education is a human right and it's a really crucial mechanism in addressing the inequalities faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. As non-Indigenous people, we have to be the ones to change. While the lack of perspective and respect for Indigenous culture is definitely a systemic issue and one that is so deeply ingrained into the fabric of this, this society, that shifting this country's ideal has to start with us. You can't sit in the dark anymore and be ignorant to this. For reconciliation to truly happen, we, uh, we need to decolonize the way that we think and start to understanding and respecting and genuinely appreciating the oldest living culture in the world. I'd like to thank you all for listening and tuning in today. And I'd also like to thank Claire for yarning with me. Thank you for having me. Please tune into the next episode of Yarning Circle for a discussion about constitutional reform.